Jack. It looks like you and Jim are all set to give me another lesson on electricity. What's on today's teaching schedule? We're going to cover electrical circuits and electrical tests, Bill. The service manuals and the instructions that come with these test instruments tell you how to connect them and read them. So there's no need for Jim and I to repeat those step-by-step -step test procedures. Instead, we're going to explain what the most commonly used test instruments tell you about a circuit. This will give you a better understanding of why and when these tests should be used for diagnosing electrical troubles. Sounds real interesting. What are you going to cover first, Jim? Batteries and battery testing, Bill. In spite of everything that's been written and said about the importance of battery condition, I'm afraid that all too often the battery isn't tested correctly or it's overlooked completely. Perhaps that's because a modern battery is remarkably trouble-free. With a reasonable amount of care, it'll do its job mile after mile and month after month. I guess that's one reason why it's frequently overlooked as a source of electrical trouble until it fails completely. On the other hand, a sick or partly charged battery causes all kinds of trouble. It affects the performance of every electrical system in the car. What's more, most of the tests we're going to cover today won't mean a thing unless the battery is in good condition and fully charged. So let's review a few important battery facts. Comparing a battery to a water tank is a common and convenient way of explaining electrical pressure and flow. However, a battery is not a storage tank for electricity. A storage battery is an electrochemical device. It produces electricity by changing chemical energy into electrical energy. Charging a battery reverses this process and uses electrical energy to produce chemical energy. Here's what that means in plain kitchen English. A battery is made up of active materials which react chemically to produce a voltage and a flow of electricity. Since battery performance depends on the amount and condition of these active materials, you should have some idea of what's inside a battery. Right you are, Tech. A storage battery has positive plates containing one kind of active material and negative plates containing a different kind of active material. The third active ingredient is the sulfuric acid in the battery fluid, or electrolyte, as it's commonly called. Electrical energy is produced by the chemical reaction between the active materials in the plates and the sulfuric acid in the electrolyte. The amount of charge in a battery depends on the chemical composition of the active material in the plates and the amount of sulfuric acid in the electrolyte. In a new, fully charged battery, all of the acid is in the electrolyte. None of it has reacted or combined with the active plate material. The general condition or capacity of the battery depends on the amount of active material in the plates and the amount of acid in the electrolyte. As a battery ages, some of the active material is lost from the plates and the amount of acid in the electrolyte is less, even though the old battery has been recharged. In other words, there is always a definite relationship or chemical balance between the amount of acid in the electrolyte and the amount as well as the chemical condition of the active material in the plates. That's why we can check battery charge and condition by using a hydrometer. But let me ask you, do you know how a hydrometer works, Bill? I think I do. Acid is heavier than water. If there's a lot of acid in the electrolyte, the float in the hydrometer will float high and you'll get a high specific gravity reading. If the acid's low, the specific gravity will be low. You understand how a hydrometer works, all right. So let's get specific about specific gravity. Jim will explain what hydrometer readings can tell you about the amount of charge and the condition of the battery. The specific gravity of a fully charged battery cell is about 1260. A specific gravity reading of 1220 indicates a battery cell that is approximately three quarters charged. However, a comparison of the specific gravity readings of all six cells of a battery will tell you more about the overall condition of the battery than the individual cell readings. For example, if the specific gravity of any cell is 25 points lower than the specific gravity of the highest cell, there's something wrong with the low cell. 
Anytime there's a variation of 25 points or more between cells, the condition of the battery is questionable. On the other hand, suppose the specific gravity of all cells is 1220 or lower, but there is less than 25 points variation between cells. In that case, there's a good chance the battery is okay and simply needs recharging. The reference book has a lot more information on specific gravity, and the service manuals cover all of the fine points of using a hydrometer to get accurate readings. I'll bone up on that information, Tech, but tell me, why bother with a hydrometer? Can't you use this gadget to check battery voltage and condition? That gadget is an open-circuit voltmeter, and you can't use it to test present production batteries. Here's why. On the new batteries having a one-piece cover over all cells, there is no way to get the probes of the tester into contact with the cell connectors. And let me warn you, don't get any ideas about drilling holes through that one-piece battery cover so you can use an open-circuit voltmeter. I've heard of some misguided mechanics trying that trick. They only succeeded in ruining the battery. On other batteries, the cell connectors are buried. If the sealing compound is pierced to take cell voltage readings, it must be carefully resealed to prevent self-discharge. I've got the answer to buried cell connectors and one-piece cell covers. This is a brand new instrument called a CAD tip battery analyzer. It does an accurate job of measuring and comparing cell voltages without contacting the cell connectors. That's a pretty slick instrument, Bill. All you have to do is drop the test probes into a pair of adjacent cells and read the test meter. You repeat this for each pair of adjacent cells. In other words, you take five separate readings. Each of these readings registers the amount of charge and compares the voltages of two adjacent cells. Now, if all five readings are within five scale divisions of each other and fall within the green zone, the battery is charged and in good condition. If all readings are within five scale divisions but fall in the red zone, the battery is probably in good condition but should be recharged and then tested again. If readings vary more than five divisions, the condition of the battery is very questionable and it probably won't pass a load test even after it's recharged. Hey, wait just a minute. You haven't told me anything about a battery load test yet. <laughs> well, this is a battery load tester. It's commonly known as a battery starter tester. Jim will explain when it is used and what it tells you. The first thing to remember is never run a load test on a battery unless the specific gravity is at least 1220. If you happen to have a can tip battery analyzer, make sure all readings are in the green zone before you run a load test. Good point, Tech. A load test tells you how a battery will perform under a full cranking load. It'll help you spot internal damage and cell deterioration that may not show up on other tests. Incidentally, a load test is sometimes called a capacity test. In our manuals, it's called a high-rate discharge capacity test. Take your choice. They all mean the same thing. You'll find more information on the battery load test and a detailed explanation of what's inside this tester in the reference book. Be sure and read it. And now, will someone please turn the record so we can hear how the battery starter tester is used to diagnose the starting system. The starting system has two separate circuits, the supply circuit and the control circuit. I suggest we review each of these circuits separately with Bell. That sounds like a good plan to me, Tech. The starter supply circuit includes the battery, the heavy insulated starter cable, the starting motor, and the battery ground cable. This is a heavy duty circuit, and it must carry a lot of current, over 200 amperes under some conditions. If the battery is okay, but cranking speed seems slow, the trouble is either in the supply circuit or in the starting motor. That's assuming, of course, that the slow cranking isn't caused by a cold engine, heavy engine oil, or some mechanical condition. Our job is to pinpoint the cause of trouble.
There are several ways to go about finding out whether the trouble is in the starter supply circuit or in the starting motor. One way is to use a battery starter tester to find out how much current the starter draws when it's cranking the engine. Why don't you explain how the battery starter tester measures amperage draw without going into the nuts and bolts details of connecting the tester and running the test. You'll find those details in the instructions that come with a particular kind of instrument you're using. Okay, Tech. With the tester connected, you crank the engine and read the exact voltage. This is battery voltage under cranking conditions, and we'll use it to find cranking amperage. With the engine not cranking, adjust the load control knob until the voltmeter again reads exact cranking voltage. What you're doing is using the adjustable resistance built into the tester to duplicate the cranking load. To get the equivalent of cranking amperage, simply flip the selector switch to the amps position and read the ammeter scale. On this meter, amperage should fall in the range marked starter. However, I look up the exact amperage draw specifications for the model I'm testing. I've got a question. Why don't you just connect an ammeter directly into the starting circuit and measure the amperage directly? You could, Bill. But you'd have to disconnect the battery cable to do that. With a starter battery tester, you don't disconnect anything. But let's get back to amperage draw. High amperage draw means the trouble is probably in the starting motor. The only other practical possibility is a cold engine or something mechanical that's causing a high cranking load. Abnormally low amperage draw means high resistance, but it doesn't tell you whether this resistance is in the motor or the supply circuit. If amperage is low and the trouble is in the motor, you'd have to remove the starter for inspection and bench tests. Before you pull a starter because of slow cranking and low amperage draw, be sure and check for high resistance in the supply circuit. Check for supply circuit resistance by taking voltage drop readings across both the starter and the ground side of the circuit. You'll find detailed instructions for doing this in the reference book. But let me give you some handy rules of thumb. Starter supply circuit voltage drops shouldn't exceed two-tenths of a volt across each cable. One-tenth of a volt from starter housing to ground and no drop across cable connections. But tell me, Bill, are you still with us? I think so, Tech. Besides, I'm sure the reference book will clear up any questions I might have. What's next? The starter control circuit, Bill. If the battery is okay, but the starter seems to be completely dead when you try to start the engine, the trouble has to be in the starter control circuit. The control circuit includes the ignition switch, the starter relay, the neutral safety switch on torque flight cars, the starter solenoid, and all of the connecting wires. A good jumper is probably the handiest tool you can use for troubleshooting the starter control circuit. Just be sure and set the parking brake and put the transmission in neutral before you start checking out the starter control circuit. Jim will tell you how to use a jumper to eliminate one unit at a time until you locate the cause of trouble. To bypass the ignition switch, connect the jumper from the ignition terminal of the relay to the battery terminal of the relay. If the car cranks, the trouble's in the ignition switch or ignition switch part of the circuit. To bypass the relay, connect a jumper from the battery terminal of the relay to the solenoid terminal of the relay. If the engine now cranks, the trouble is in the relay. There is one other thing to check before you condemn the relay. On cars equipped with torque flight, the relay won't close if the neutral safety switch isn't working. You can eliminate this possibility by connecting a jumper from the ground terminal of the relay to a good ground. If this jumper solves the cranking problem, the trouble is in the neutral switch. Of course, a jumper from the battery terminal of the relay to the solenoid terminal of the relay eliminates everything in the control circuit except the starter. If this jumper doesn't crank the engine, the trouble has to be in the starter. 
And that just about takes care of the starting system. So let's give Bill a rundown on the ignition primary circuits. Primary circuits? Is there more than one? Yes, Bill. The ignition run circuit goes from the run terminal of the ignition switch through the ballast resistor and then to the ignition coil. From the ignition coil, the circuit goes to the distributor, where it is completed by the ground circuit through the ignition contacts. The other circuit is the ignition start circuit. It originates at the start terminal of the ignition switch, bypasses the ballast resistor, and goes directly to the ignition coil. The rest of the circuit is the same as the run circuit, to ground through the distributor. Why don't you explain to Bill what a voltmeter can tell him about trouble in the ignition circuits? Okay, Tech. I'll give him the what and why of these tests and let him read the how-to-do-it details in the reference book. A cranking voltage test is a good starting place for locating ignition circuit troubles. For this test, a voltmeter is connected to the input side of the coil so that it measures voltage at the coil under a cranking load. If voltage at the coil is 9 and 6 tenths volts or higher, the resistance in the ignition start circuit is okay. Low cranking voltage, less than 9 and 6 tenths volts, indicates high resistance in the ignition start circuit, questionable battery condition, or starting troubles. Since we've already covered battery and starter testing, let's stick to the ignition circuit. A voltmeter connected across the circuit from the battery to the input terminal of the ballast resistor measures the voltage drop in the ignition run circuit. The drop should be no more than 35 hundredths of a volt. If it's more, check for loose connections or a faulty ignition switch. Here's something to remember. The ignition switch has two sets of contacts. The ignition start contacts may be okay, and the ignition run contacts burn or vice versa. In other words, the car may start, but not keep running. Or maybe it would run, but not always start. Here's another possibility. If there is an open circuit in the ballast resistor, the car would start, but it wouldn't run. A jumper across the ballast resistor would diagnose that trouble. These are good tips. Does that finish the ignition circuit? Not quite, Bill. Jim hasn't said anything about the circuit beyond the ignition coil yet. I'll take care of that right now. Connect a voltmeter from the distributor side of the coil to ground to measure the voltage drop across the distributor. A voltage drop of more than one-tenth volt means high resistance inside the distributor. It could mean too much resistance between the distributor and the engine block. To check out that possibility, Move the grounded voltmeter lead from the engine block to the distributor housing. If the drop is still more than one-tenth volt, the resistance is inside the distributor. Wow! I sort of hoped that we would get into the charging circuit, but it looks like we've used up all of our time. Do you know what I think? I think you and Jim have covered just about all I could soak up in one session. Today's lesson has given me a much better understanding of battery testing and circuit troubleshooting. You're probably right, Bill. Besides, the charging circuit diagnosis instructions in the service manual are mighty complete. I think you could check out an alternator and regulator if you took your time. I'll tell you what we'll do, Bill. One of these days, we'll devote an entire session to the charging system. In the meantime... Be sure and read the reference book for this session. You'll find a lot more detailed information about batteries, the starting system, and the ignition circuits. And don't forget, I'm depending on all of you master technicians out there to take good care of your customers' cars while we're absent one from the other. See you all next month. <laughs>